Um, my name is Tara Moeller. I am really excited to be part of this panel. I'm a bit of a connected fitness uh, geek, if you will, um, self-proclaimed. Um, uh, before we start getting in into like connected fitness and all, where all the learnings that this panel has had, I, by show, I'd love to do show of hands because I like a little audience participation. Won't make you dance quite yet, but um, who has a connected fitness piece of equipment? So whether it be a Peloton, whether it be an Echelon, whether it be a tread, a hydro, a okay. So we got a handful. All right. Hands down, so connected fitness, um, wearable, so whether it be your Apple Watch, whether it be a Fitbit, who, I know you guys have, yeah, okay. And then finally, who does connected fitness in terms of um, community, whether it be an application, so your Map My Fitness, your Strava, your, I mean, come on, everyone, right? <laughs> Checking your, your steps. I mean, if it, if it didn't, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen, right? People like, like everyone has stopped their workout to start, um, start an app for sure. So. I'm really excited to be part of this panel. Um, we've learned a lot together those last few weeks and have had um, a really great uh, onboarding um, um, conversations. And really what we're trying to think about is how do we create this new category and wh what comes next and what are the technologies and infrastructure that you think about when you think about um, connected fitness um, um, and what category is, is created from then. And so uh, I did a really quick, here's what we'll learn about. Um, so we will drop knowledge, but, but be prepared. It might be also drop an F-bomb, as if, if you will. Yeah, <laughs> you, we'll let you figure out who that, might, uh, who that person might be. But um, so there's three things we'll talk about. Um, first, uh, category creation. Uh, we, have a, we have three people from really distinct brands that have created really interesting categories. Love to hear about learnings, failures, what you wish you would have done. Um, differently. Um, the second was is, is really want to talk about the customer experience. So how are we reimagining delivering digital and content differently? And then we'll just follow up with um, what does this future look like? And um, we've got some really great things to show. We're not just going to talk about it um, philosophically. What they're going to show you is something that um, I only think one other group has seen before. So it'll be really interesting. All right. So let's dive in. So I, I love to talk about the entrepreneur, with the entrepreneur first, the true person who, um, who basically hightailed it out of Microsoft, a really cush job, a regular paycheck in a desk in an office, and, and said, you know what, I'm going to just um, you know, have some sleepless nights and, and do fundraising nonstop. And so Stephen from Asensei, let's hear about your journey in the last four years or so. Oh yeah, I mean, I think you know when we were speaking earlier, the question was, why do you make this decision to, you know, jump out of the comfort zone and uh, into the unknown? And I think, uh, you know, someone that has mentored me for many years has a great expression: uh, never mistake a clear line of sight for a short distance. Uh, and I think oftentimes, you know, I really loved the first presentation. And as we were speaking about, you know, we kind of feel like that second wave is coming. That's what I was feeling five or six years ago. And you know, I've worked inside big companies like Microsoft and Adobe. And you look to these companies as being innovative, but the innovation kind of happens on a 12-month cycle. You have to be really looking at how is this going to deliver in the next 12 months. And it's hard to really do that. What does the future look like in three or four years kind of innovation inside of a big company? You need to step out. Uh, you need to have the courage to kind of step out and do it. And I think you know, the only way being inside those big companies that we really found um, we could innovate is when we could start to partner with some of these uh, these smaller companies. So yeah, I've jumped out uh, four or five years ago and started Ascensi, and we think there's a we think there's a category that emerges from connected fitness, um, and we've named it and framed it as connected coaching. Uh, we think we're moving beyond uh, tracking to teaching, beyond counting to coaching. Uh, and as we'll speak about later, perhaps, beyond just looking at biometrics to starting to look at things like biomechanics. So it's a very different future. It requires a lot of new technology, and it requires collaboration with, uh, um, I'm going to call you guys the incumbents now, but uh, you know, it requires <laughs> collaboration with an incumbent. And uh, yeah, we're terrified, and we're excited. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> Terrifying yeah. incitement, that's always it's my daily, daily fear. Yeah, at the same like, time. Yeah. yeah. So um, and, and so Allison, you're at Fitbit. Um, you and Chris have worked together before in a, in a previous life, but Fitbit, you could really say, has uh, was a category creator of, of sort of tracking steps, but really definitely taking it to the, a mass market. So if 
I'd love to hear just a few thoughts on, on creating that and what you guys have learned there. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, we really created a movement in getting people moving, right? So yes, people were walking, but really getting people outside and getting active. And since then, we pioneered sleep tracking, where previously you could really only get that data when you're in a lab, and so be able to have that right on your wrist for the consumers to really understand all that data. So all of this obviously continuing to provide insights and guidance so people understand what is all this information that's getting me moving, that's getting me out there, and making sure that we're continuing to connect the community as well, so that way they have people motivating them, supporting them as they're moving on this health and fitness journey. I'm so interested to hear your thoughts on where it moves beyond the wrist or does it. But, and then Mr. Frankel at TRX, he's been at TRX for a little over 11 years, and That's talk right. about somebody who, a company who's really created a category of, of suspension training, right, and, and bringing it to homes and really trying to figure out how to educate the consumer on how to use these mysterious straps that are hanging in my living room. Right, so as, you know, as I see myself on this panel and we look at the most you know, low-tech, kind of high-concept approach of they don't like it when I say this to the company, hey, it's a pair of tie-down straps with handles on it, but how could we bring it to market in such a way that uh, we, we did a really analog approach of we have to be able to bring this product to life through, uh, through content and education. And so we went out and we recruited about 300 uh, instructors around the world who have now touched somewhere between 250, 300,000 people. But the problem is, you know, every layer of communication that goes down, you lose a little bit of fidelity on you know, the science and the application behind it. So we've started to look for the right partners to uh, get behind this concept of movement as a vital sign, meaning, hey, no matter what information you're getting, we know that moving is gonna drive the physiology, it's gonna drive the connectedness that, that goes in there. So we um, uh, not objectively say, hey, we've been ahead of the uh, industry and the curve in terms of content, IP, and structure. We just haven't had a way to collect the right information and push it out there and then curate our content a little bit better. So that's what we're excited about. I mean, you about. guys were sh shipping the straps, what, in 2005? So you had to create an instruction manual or content around how to use the strap. So, so you guys kind of like to say, hey, we were the first to create this protocol or this, this um, syllabus of information to teach the consumer. So I think that's really interesting as how we think about what, where we are today and, and the categories that, created, that we've created. So, you touched on something which I'd love to talk about is, is reimagining content and delivery, right? So I know Stephen and I talk a lot about um, um, sort of that Jane Fonda. I'll let, I steal his thunder a little bit, but like the Jane Fonda videos that were on DVD, at, or excuse me, VHS, or even <laughs> VHS. DVD. V VMX, uh, yeah, G VHS. give my um, yeah. six-year-old a VHS and he'll be like, what, what the heck is this? Is there candy in here? Um, but then you go to DVD and then you go to iPods and then than streaming. So really the content is sort of the same, but the distribution has changed. So you've touched on a little bit about, and, and actually the panel, teed, the panel prior teed this really, really well, and I was sort of looking at Chris in the back, salivating at this idea of how do you scale this one-on-one -on -one conversation? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, uh, the, the previous panel that was talking about working with the professional teams you know, working with professional teams, working with the military, also working with the end consumer. I think the thing we've run into right now is, uh, hey, we get data that everybody thinks is a, is a solution, is an answer, but really data is just a piece of information. Until you put it in play, it doesn't become knowledge. Until you have experience behind it, it doesn't become, you know, wisdom, wisdom or really become meaningful or useful. Uh, and it's really now all about making the experience and the information meaningful to that person uh, as an entry point but then instead of just kind of speaking to the masses, how now does that information become meaningful to me? So uh, Steve and I were having the conversation last night. Hey, as a coach, you know, what is it about being a coach that, that makes it powerful for the athlete or for the average person that walks in front of you? I walk in and I watch you run or I watch you use uh, TRX or I watch you do anything. Just because I've been in the industry 40 years, I look at you, see what you're doing now, project forward to where I know you need to be, have a sense of where you've been in the past, and so now I know what's important now. If there's 50 streams of data coming in and I'm trying to figure out which one's the most important, we've lost them. How do I figure out what's the most important thing I can get you to do right now to make a positive impact to move forward? And up till you know, the last two or three years, we really haven't had this mix of you know, AI being artificial intelligence and AI being authentic intelligence of a coach and bring those things together to really make it powerful and meaningful. 
Uh, and right now you put on YouTube, our biggest competitor right now is YouTube. You put on YouTube and you get this random piece of information and you take and you run with it like gospel. But then, uh, like we saw that roller coaster before, the, the novelty wears off and what do I do now? And that's why we, you know, connected fitness, we have a pretty unfit, unhealthy culture out there. How do we take what we already have and really spin the culture in the right way? And I think that's where the content experience Yeah, I'd love goes. to jump in on that. Because um, when we think about category creation, we have to think about what's the current state and what does the future state look like and how do you define that in a from to? That's one of the first things we've done, irrespective of whether it's connected fitness to connected coaching or uh, you know, bricks and mortar retail to digital retail. It's like, what's that from to? And so I think for me, you know, again, the conversation we were having last night, um, you know, the from two is very much about moving away from just taking, you know, from curation and collection of data to actually turning it into insight. Um, and I like to define it. Um, I, I think there's always a tendency as technologists that we talk in terms of the technology and we don't talk in terms of the end user. And so I, I always talk about the athlete and I use the Nike definition of an athlete. If you have a body, you're an athlete. Um, and for the athlete to be coached, we need to be able to do three things. Um, we need to scale Frankel. That's, uh, well, that's one thing. But to do that, there's three things we need to do. We need to be able to see what he says, see what he sees. We have to be able to say what he says. And we have to be able to teach what he teaches. And that kind of reveals to me, well, where are we lacking in technology? How can, what's the enabling technologies that allow us to have the same eyes uh, that Frankel has when he looks at you hanging off TRX straps or he sees you in the weight room? What are the coaching cues that he uses? And when does he decide to say them? And when does he decide to just keep them to himself because you're not ready for that lesson yet? And how do we uh, move away from a, um, I often call the YouTube videos, it's like a bag of doorknobs. You're just kind of shaking this bag and you're reaching in and you're pulling one out. Um, really, we want to move away from that bag of doorknobs experience from, it's, it's not incumbent on the athlete to choose their own training syllabus. It's the coach's decision in that moment of, I was plan anytime, I, so I, you know, I coach, I coach martial arts, I coach jiu-jitsu and karate, and like no plan survives first contact with the class. You walk into the class to teach, but then the second you see a student or a collection of students making the same mistake, that's the direction you're pulled in with the class. So to teach what a coach teaches, we have to be able to, to have that flexibility to, uh, uh, to be pulled, pulled through a, a learning path or pulled through a teaching syllabus. And so that's how I think about the, how the new, that's how I think about the technologies that need to exist for the new category of coaching to emerge from this, uh, this uh, can I call it an old category now yeah. of, yeah, of connected could, fitness? Actually. Can yeah. I answer, I can speak yeah. to that too from a Fitbit perspective because you guys are getting all this information and so the data that we're delivering is looking at dynamic and correlated insights based on the data we have. So we can understand if you're not sleeping well, how will that impact your activity? Right. How will that impact your eating? So making sure that we're also delivering content that's relative and related to you based on what we're seeing from the data. So that's on your wrist, that's on your mobile, right? So all the different mechanics that we have to deliver the content. And when you talk about the athlete, you know, the Fitbit athlete doesn't necessarily need an edge, but he needs motivation and guidance and tools. And then that's where it comes, we look at it more as like, how can we do personalized content and make sure that it's really relevant to them on whatever health and fitness journey that customer has? Because, you know, everyone's an athlete, but how do we deliver that experience and making sure that we're, during their ups and downs, we're giving them guidance and tools and insights that really help them, and whether that's dynamic coaching on the wrist or through other platforms. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, it's just so interesting. I pick up, I pick on Strava all the time. I know these guys are sick of me hearing it, but Strava has 46 million users on their platform, of which something like 70% are outside of the US, right? And so when you think about collecting all of this data, and I know all these connected fitness, you're collecting the data, where whether your Peloton is see how many workouts you're doing, check, check. You know, whether you're active and you're on the treadmill, the guy has no idea if I'm on the treadmill or, or I'm watching, I'm drinking a beer, watching basketball. From his podcast recording yeah, exactly, studio. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so, so what do, how do we, what is the so what, now what? And I think that's where the, that we evolve into the future. Okay, great guys, we've got 46 million users. We know what they're, what they're doing. We know how often they work out. We know how, what their routes are. But, and, and for you, Allison, you guys are starting to have so much data. So what are you going to do with how do you create customization? How are you going to get to a point where you can scale Chris Frankel on that intimate coaching with the amount of data that you have? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Meg was talking about earlier that things are moving more towards health, right? So we're really creating that integrated health device and services experience that can guide and motivate you for these healthy habits. And so looking at the content, it's making sure that however we're delivering it, so through our premium paid membership, on the wrist, through the app, that there's really content that resonates based on what your weight loss, activity, sleep, whatever your goals are, because there is a lot of content out there, but we have to make sure we're delivering it to you <coughs> timely, whether we're doing reminders to move and making sure that you're just getting active. We um, you know, collaborate with TRX to make sure, we want to make sure people get their workouts in, so there's a TRX app right here on your wrist, so wherever you are, you can get your workout in with your straps, right? So making sure that whatever your fitness and health goals are, we can kind of help you through that based on you know, what tools you want to have. I think what's really interesting here as well is, you know, when you start speaking about coaching, coaching is so broad. You have to pick a niche and you have to own that niche. And I think Fitbit have done a, you know, a tremendous job of saying, you know, our niche is in, our niche, our niche is, is in that health coaching. Um, and health coaching is moving. Now that we've got people moving, we need to look at nutrition. We need to look at sleep. Um, for me, you know, the niche I've picked is, um, you know, we all need to learn to move properly. Now, sport is a very obvious uh, category for that. And, you know, any of us, I mean, how many people have played a sport here um, where your coach spoke to you and, uh, you know, move your hip a few radians per second faster, <laughs> or, uh, you know, I need to see 4G acting on your knee. How many of you have, you know, nobody, right? We don't, we don't speak as coaches, we don't speak to our athletes. Uh, in the vocabulary or the vernacular of gyroscopes and magnetometers and accelerometers. We just say left leg forward. No, put your other left leg forward. That's kind of the way we, 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 we try to cue you. Um, and so I think for sport coaching, um, and that branches into physical therapy and the industrial athlete, there's a unique opportunity as well to really start thinking about um, not how do we make more sense of the data we have, but how do we, um, there's someone I really like, Dr. Fergus Connolly, he talks about working back from the score. How do we work back from the score? If I want to make you a better rower, if I want to drop your marathon time, um, if I want to um, you know, improve your baseball pitch, I'm not going to do it with the data we're collecting today. I need to think differently about the data we're collecting. I need to look at your biomechanics, uh, not look at your biometrics or not look at that. Uh, so how do you look at some of these biomechanics and biometric at scale? I'm glad you asked that question. It's almost like I teed you up for it. Uh, so I, I do want to I do want to show something and we then you play uh, a little baseball up I'd love too. to I'd love to have Frank will talk about this a little bit as well but uh, but Alison uh, you said something just a few moments ago uh, about sleep which I really liked which is taking it out of the lab um, and I think yeah if we look at um, if we look at biomechanics uh, Olympic athletes professional athletes have had access to technologies uh, like high-end motion capture for many years the Sydney Olympics was quite famous uh, for the use of motion capture, but we're talking million dollar Vicon camera systems that are lined up and high speed photography. How do we take that work of the wizards and put it into the hands of us mere mortals? Um, and that's the enabling technology we look for. Uh, essentially, we call it apparel, um, app connected apparel. Uh, and I'm not going to, I'm actually wearing it just now because I've got a whole bunch of demos lined up for, for after this panel. Uh, so if you see me scratching, it's the compression apparel <laughs> I'm wearing uh, underneath my gear here. Um, but this is, from a, this is from a presentation I gave on stage just, uh, just before the holidays. And that's me. Uh, you'll be able to tell by the poor uh, rotation as I put my hand up there. That's definitely me. Um, but uh, you can just see that we're essentially recognizing just from the apparel, no cameras, you know, we're streaming sensor data from apparel to your phone, and that's the correct. You know, every time I put this gear on, I have to throw a few roundhouse kicks. I just kind of can't help myself. Uh, but you're seeing the recognition there. So, so this is for us the enabling technology, but even this is not enough. Just knowing that my left arm is up or my left leg is up, that's the beginning of the problem solved. And, uh, you know, I'll skip past this, but frankly, uh, I think when you and I met and spoke about, um, you know, what does this mean for TRX coaching, uh, you know, it was just one of those great moments of like, I'm not going to drop the first bomb, but it well, was one of those yeah. holy moly moments. Everyone's waiting for me to break the seal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is what's interesting, yeah. right? So now we have data points. We have a ton of data points. And now you actually need this other AI, this other AI you said, which was? Authentic. Authentic, authentic intelligence. Yeah, authentic. So interesting. Like so that. you need an actual coach in the room to say, you know what? This, this guy's hips is out of alignment or this, this you know, whatever that might and be. Even, so like, even if we take a, take a back a step, because my, my background is I've coached everything from eight-year-olds up to professional athletes, a lot of cross in the military. And the whole idea to being in what I used to teach our, our undergrad students was, hey, the job you're going to have in 10 years has not been created now. How do you come down with a language that, uh, and concepts that can grow as you grow? So what 
we did from a TRX training uh, technology perspective was how can we come up with a sense of cueing and categorizing uh, human movements. We broke it down into seven or eight what we call foundational movements. Each one of those movements have standards in them that you can speak to a room full of 12 year olds up to elite athletes. But their sense and perception of, hey, I'm moving that my feet are staying flat and my hips are getting below my knees and my spine is staying upright. What they think is happening, their sense of perception versus reality is shockingly bad. Uh, and it used to just be that that happened when you got over 25. We're now seeing it in kids as young as eight years old. So wow. now we can have a feedback system that just nudges them in the right way, where, where, where everybody doesn't get a trophy for being able to do a squat, but you get a nudge of like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for, or hey, you've done this better in the past, and now we've created an environment where somebody learns, because the, the, the dirty secret to coaching and teaching is I don't coach or teach anything. I have to create the environment where the person learns, and now we're creating an environment where we've really been missing out on the masses of what do they call biomechanics, motor control, or just how do I control my body? Everything starts from there. We're gonna drive physiology from movement. If, you know, if I know you're moving well, almost everything else I do on top of that is just gonna get magnified in terms of output and results. So, so I was a collegiate rower and I, I had to chuckle because my coach would always say, oh, your shoulders need to, you know, you know drop your shoulders forward. And he's like, oh, Tara, you roll like a bull in a china shop. And I thought, huh, that must be super strong. <laughs> it wasn't, it's instantly meant I had terrible form. Um, but it would have been great to have um, right. the apparel uh, along so they could see, okay, so no, move even further. And then until that, until my body got into that position is when I could move into the next to that moment. So I think that that is really a cool thing to talk about when we talk about the connect, the, the future of connected fitness and, and this new category. Well, we talked, talked about, we talked about, I think the you know, conversation we've all had is like, how do you reimagine the content? Like, you know, you know, Tara stole my Jane Fonda example, but that's fine. Um, but you know, if, if you look at a Jane Fonda workout video or a Cindy Crawford workout video or a Billy Blanks Taibo video, and you look at Peloton or Nike Digital, Really, the experience hasn't changed. Just the delivery medium has changed, but it's still watch an instructor on the screen, talented student on the left, not so talented student on the right. You have to decide for yourself which one you are and which one do we all pick. We're all legends in our own mind, so we all try to um, you know, follow the talented student. And you've made it incumbent on the athlete to become the coach. It's Dunning-Kruger's theorem. You, you just don't have the knowledge you need to know of what you should be doing correctly. And so when I think about reimagining content, um, we need to go from, from two, we need to go from linear content. You know, we've all stuck that P90X DVD in and it's the same workout that you did 400 times. It doesn't get harder as you get better. It doesn't get easier um, when you're struggling. So for me, it's how, how do you take that content apart and how do I watch you do a TRX squat row and if it sucks, I take you back to let's just do the squat and let's work on the squat mechanics. Okay, do 10 more, that's good. Let's put the squat row back together again. So I think you know, now that we have um, you know, technologies like a sensei where we can observe movement, we can have the, have the eyes, we can see what the coach sees, we can start to really think about how content isn't something that you hit the play button on and you watch the progress bar move along, but content is mixed media. It's uh, sometimes the right cue is just audio and a reminder in your ear. Sometimes it's look at me do something so I can show you what uh, a reference of good is. And sometimes it's both at the same time. And so I think that's what's really exciting about some of the collaborations now is like, how do we reimagine how we capture content, how we create content, and then how we how we think about delivering that content. Well, Allison, you, you heard the opening. This might be put, put you on the spot a little bit, but um, you heard Meg talk about wearables equals um, on the wrist, right? Is Fitbit going beyond the wrist? Are you guys, I mean, because right now what we think about connected fitness is somebody is on a piece of equipment, whether it be in a gym or wherever, looking at a screen. And is wearables something different for Fitbit in the future? I mean, right now you have an experience with Fitbit where you can have the tracker, you can have an on workout experience right here. We have our mobile app experience as well. We have all this new content that we're delivering through our premium um, membership, which we launched in the fall. And so on there is guided programs. There's different programs depending on where you are in your fitness journey. There are different workouts, there are challenges, leaderboards. We have our community of feed that we're driving through there. And so right now, we're currently using a number of different platforms right now, but it's all connected through our ecosystem, right? And so um, right now, we have all these mechanisms right now. So whether you are using the wrist or on the mobile, um, there's a solution for you. I think it's really important that, you know, uh, technology drives the change of uh, form factor. 
And, you know, so I, I think as we start to see, you know, we took a hard bet with the Sensei, should it be computer vision? Should there be a camera watching you? Um, or should it, be the, should it be the apparel? And, you know, there's very few, I used to work with Microsoft and with the Xbox team, and like there's so many videos of coffee tables and cats running in front of you as you're doing yoga. It's really hard to use cameras in, a, in an unconstrained environment. Um, but I think when I look at things like, you know, Fitbit, I'll take a position here. It is inevitable uh, that our heart rate monitoring, our biometrics tracking, and our biomechanics, it's all going to come through the apparel. And if you walk the show floor down at the Sands, there are multiple companies. It feels like at CES, you see the same stuff every year. Uh, but I would say, well, it feels like it to me. Uh, but I, I would say this year, we're seeing a lot more companies that have got apparel that is literally like washable, dryable. And then as you walk down some of the, some of the, the other aisles, you're seeing flexible batteries, you're seeing stretchable, washable cables. So the enabling components are there for us to start to think about it's as easy as pulling on shirt and pants uh, to, to, to connect ourselves, to connect our bodies to the cloud. Um, and that becomes like super uh, Yeah, you're, super you're, you guys talk about connected fitness and then to connected coaching, but at some point you're still collecting data, so you still need the Chris Frankel's eye in there to prescribe the next movement or prescribe the, you know, we talked about aptitude, right? Every athlete that embarks in, in a program and every athlete, every person, my, my goal of movement is different than your goal of movement. So you still, even though you're creating this data and, and collecting this data and this movements, in these new form factors, whatever they might be, um, you still need the eye of a human. Is that what we're saying? Yes and no. Okay. You need to make it meaningful, and no one's ever going to recreate you know, my eye or another great coach's eye, but having had the experience of travel around the world and worked with some of the greatest coaches is you try to boil down, okay, even though all their theories and technologies and approaches have a certain amount of differences, they all have a certain amount of uh, commonalities as well. So can you start from you know, this basic model of movement having a certain amount of standards on it from a biomechanical standpoint? Uh, then how are we putting load on top of it? How are we starting to count our steps? What kind of internal load are we getting from heart rate on there? And start to guide you down that road. And really the future is not so much the push out of the coach's eye, which I think we can get to pretty quickly, but then the pull back and start to say, hey, uh, you are a male of 57 years old and this is where you started out. These are the kind of uh, exercise routines you did. This was the quality of your movement. You start to pull that data in to start to create uh, refined models as you continue to go forward because as a famous statistician once said, all models are wrong. Some work better than others, but now it's trying to switch this incoming information to create archetypes of, hey, this is where I have been. This is where I am now. This is where I want to go. Hey, this is where we know it's going to be the most fluid way to modify your training as you go forward. Because right now we're still working off of means and standard deviations. Yeah. That's going away even in, in sports science. We're now looking at means and standard deviations, but also looking at individual trends and, and how they work. Well, so when you think about things. TRX, you wouldn't necessarily think like, oh, let's, t let's bring TRX, you know, this, this very analog brand to talk about connect the future of connected fitness. So it's an interesting segue into sort of this final point of, of how do we get to this future, right? Is it that TRX just dominates and it's like, like winner take all and you know, Peloton is gonna rule the world or Nike is gonna rule the world or where you're alluded is I, I know this part really, really well and this is my core competency. I'm gonna be very purposeful about how TRX moves forward but I need experts in these spaces around here. So I know, I know there's been some interesting collaborations here and Chris, I know you and Allison did a collaboration with TRX and, and, and um, Fitbit, and I'd love just to see a little bit about that. Oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> such a soft I mean, do something. And I think one of the things that's interesting here is, you know, you might be working out for 30 minutes or an hour, or you might have your apparel on that's connected, but we've got the customer 24 seven, right? So all the data that we're collecting impacts how they're gonna perform doing the, ex doing the exercises with TRX, or when they're performing with the a Sensei clothing on it. So when the collaboration happened here, it's, hey, we wanna be able to provide different workouts for our customers that make it no, no matter where they are, they can work out. And so TRX, having total body, core, cardio, upper body, whatever you want to do, right there on your wrist is no excuse to miss a workout, right? So that's what we're really delivering and getting TRX that connection because a lot of people, TRX is in different classes and one of the hard parts is people don't understand what am I tracking, right? They're used to tracking everything and so they don't understand how was my heart rate? What was the information when I did the workout? How was I performing? And so 
this is where we started to work together, and you know, this is now something that people can access wherever they are. Because Chris, you would never look internally and say, I want to build an entire data infrastructure that collects all this information, because that's not your core That's concept. not my proficiency, yeah, and, and I've been pretty well behaved up here, and I'll try and remain that way, but one thing that's... <laughs> like, bums me out. That's, that's <laughs> super, super frustrating, because I think that's a valid question in this environment, but these are the same conversations we have at the university level of, uh, you know what, our exercise science department better be talking to our math department better be talking to our analytics department because you know you get really competent in one area it's called the training capacity the better i get better in this area the worse i get across here uh, and at the end of the day let's let's take let's take commerce out of this we're talking about affecting people's lives we know we know that movement and exercise affects the brain we know brain affects the, how the body works we know how that uh, affects how i feel about myself and how i feel about the people that are around me holy shit, why are we taking so long to say, hey, should we have an engineer and a coach and somebody that has a huge brand out there to really spread, you know, this whole idea, can we do well and do good at the same time? If you're still having that conversation, kiss my ass, you've missed the boat. If you don't have a data strategy and a content strategy that really starting to reach out and say, hey, you know what, the, the healthier and the more educated my consumers are or my potential customers are, Everybody wins on there. So can we do it absolutely all alone? TRX is a strap company that has some kind of smart people involved in it. But if we can't <laughs> execute uh, at, at a higher level, then yeah, so those, short those answer is yes. I thought, I thought let's, let's cue this video before we run out of time, but I, because you're so passionate about the way we move and not just tracking and clicking off the fact that we have moved, um, these guys teamed up, and the video is, is really pretty powerful. So I'll let Stephen... Yeah, I'll tell you that. But just the one thing I want to add beforehand is, like, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, or even like in my past life, I'd be called an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur <laughs> inside of a big company. Um, you have to look for the opportunities to partner and collaborate. You, you get to the future faster together, for sure. Um, and a, you know, a core thing, uh, whether you're resource constrained because you have to report quarterly, or resource constrained because you raise funding for 12 months of your life, um, you, you really need to decide is what's core to me, what do I have to do? And like, I don't want to introduce TRX strength training with like a real-time voice of Chris Frankel in your ear and go and hire 50 TRX instructors to create the content. I want to partner with TRX. So we'll finish and show you this very short, uh, it's just vignettes out of a longer video, but I want to make sure that uh, you see what the coaches are seeing uh, as we're showing this to you. So you're going to see somebody wearing a sensei, and I can show this to you guys outside. You're going to see somebody wearing a sensei. Uh, they're also wearing an earpiece that's tracking their head as well as their body. And as they are practicing, in the moment, a sensei is deciding what coaching they need to hear and putting pre-recorded voice of Chris Frankel into your ear. Uh, and you're also going to see content discovery. No more reaching into the bag and deciding what YouTube video will I will see today. You'll see a girl practicing yoga, struggling with that practice, and not even knowing that TRX could help her with yoga. You'll see her being guided into TRX. So let's just finish with the short 30 seconds run over of the video. <laughs> Higher. Good. Right. One, remember, eyes follow your hand. Great correction. One more. Great job. Reach up, warrior one. Arms down, warrior two. Sweep your left hand round further. Push the sound away. Good. Shift weight, warrior three. Pause drill. Arms away. Good, body over. That's perfect. And row. I'll skip past this. If you make equipment, if you make apparel, we want to put the voices of guys like uh, Frankel uh, in your customers' ears. Um, and you know, people always say, this is so futuristic. It's so 2019. We can't wait to. Uh, we can't wait to. I love uh, following get the through with like when we think about reimagining the future. We just don't sit up here philosophically thinking about the future. We get to actually show some really interesting, um, interesting moments that we're actually here and now. We have to just uh, uh, get there together faster. So I think that's sort of the the finish of our of our um, speech. Thank you so much for listening. And um, we don't have time for questions, but they'll hang out in the back for you guys if you guys um, have any other further thoughts. Thanks, Thank you, Julie. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.